overwhelm the healthcare system. So Dr. Strain will go into some detail on some new restrictions, but, but I want to point out a couple of things off the top. Uh, number one, we need to change our approach to testing. We've been leaders in testing and Nova Scotians love to test. Thank you for that. Uh, but the reality is we don't have an un unlimited supply of tests and we need to continue to lead in testing. But this time we need to be uh, leading in very focused testing. So right now is the time to make sure for to, we have tests available for those that are symptomatic. Uh, we need to do this to support our, our lab team. So we'll talk about a testing strategy, but uh, please don't hoard the, the self-tests, the home tests. Uh, we'll continue to lead, but it'll be, it'll be leading in, in focused testing. Uh, number two, the, uh, the Omicron uh, data is coming in from around the world, and there are really their differing opinions on the severity of the illness. Our reality here in Nova Scotia is that we are seeing hospitalizations. We started to see hospitalizations this weekend, and now we have 10 people in the hospital uh, since the outbreak started um, two weeks ago. 10 people might not sound like much, but it's, uh, but it's certainly an increase against the backdrop of the well-known stresses that were already on our healthcare system. And so we need to take steps to support our healthcare workers. And we need to take this increase in hospitalizations very seriously. Uh, and the third thing I want to talk to you off the top is, you know, we're seeing human resource issues impact service. It's not necessarily that people are extremely sick, uh, but it's that they're having to isolate. So we're seeing this in healthcare, but not just in, in healthcare, other critical systems uh, and first, uh, first responders and essential services. We're seeing it in police, fire, transit. Uh, we're seeing it in many places. There's a lot of people that are off work because they're isolating. So we have to take steps now to, to really slow down uh, the spread and to protect all of these services. So all of these, all of these facts uh, point to the need to tighten up. So, so tighten up is what we'll do. It's that simple. Uh, COVID has asked a lot of our essential service teams. They've been flat out for almost two years. They've had no slow periods, no breaks. Uh, these are our family, our friends, and our neighbors. They're hurting. Um, they're under pressure mentally and, and physically, and they have been for a while. So we're asking a lot of Nova Scotians. Uh, we're, we're sorry to do that. Uh, I'm sorry to have to do that. Um, but we have, to, we have to tighten up the restrictions. Um, there have been many questions about boosters. Uh, I will tell you this. Public health is working to do whatever it takes to get booster doses in eligible arms. Um, it's, it's important to, these boosters are important to combat the variant, but they're also extremely important for our collective mental health. Um, the, the political decision, almost the easy thing, would be just to simply say, we'll get doses in everyone's arms right away. Um, but that's not the right move. Uh, not only is it at odds with the science, it's just not practical. The supply is not there. Um, look at the um, Hunger Games type environment that we're seeing taking place in other jurisdiction, uh, other jurisdictions. That that benefits no one. So saying you can get a booster just so that it sounds good, it doesn't it doesn't help anyone. The right move is to stick with the science, just like we always have here in Nova Scotia. And the science um, we focus on is advice from uh, from NASI. And uh, we, we, we have, um, in Dr. Strang, we have, we have the best in the country. So we'll continue to listen to Dr. Strang and focus on the science. Um, it's always served us well in the past and it will serve us well going forward. So what the science does say is that the booster doses are most effective for anyone 18 and older um, if, it's, if it's been at least six months since their second dose. So we'll stick to that six month guidance, um, but here's, here's, the, here's the reality. By mid-January, almost 640,000 Nova Scotians will tip over that six month mark. Um, they are not all there today, but over the next few weeks, they will be. Uh, and those people are our primary focus. But we don't have 640,000 booster doses. We're working with the federal government to increase our supply, um, but so is everyone else. So today we have around 100,000 doses. Uh, so for, for this reason, and to avoid the Hunger Games type scenario here in our province, uh, where, where the most vulnerable, um, we want the most vulnerable to get their booster first. 
So what we can do is we can open up uh, to those over 50 and over six months. And we can do, and we will do that tomorrow, uh, effective tomorrow. That, that cohort alone, over 50 and over six months since their second dose, we will, that will consume those 100,000 doses. Uh, for everyone else, uh, I want you to know we're working uh, with the federal government and we hope to have the necessary doses in time to meet the need over those next couple of weeks. We've requested those doses. Um, and as soon as we get those massive quantities, we will open it to everyone that meets the NACI eligibility um, of, of six months. But between today and then, we have to be we have to be smart with what we have. If NACI changes its guidance, we will too. Um, and again, we'll be working with the, the federal government. But we're not in the business of doting NACI. Uh, we're not. There's no need to to dote the six month eligibility uh, criteria. Uh, we won't, and and you shouldn't either. Um, six month is the trigger, and we're working with the federal government to get those to get those doses. So. Um, and I can I can promise you that the team uh, at public health and the department and, and our team, we're working tirelessly to ramp up. It is going to take time, but it's coming. Um, it, it may take time to get your appointment, um, but we're, we're looking at the supply. And once we have the supply, we'll, we'll get we'll get we'll get things really rolling. So um, it doesn't do anybody any good to allow appointments to be booked only to find out later on that they can't be filled. We don't want to go there. That wouldn't be fair. We will have new appointments opening as soon as we have the certainty over the supply. Uh, Minister Thompson spoke with the, the federal minister yesterday and has and, and again today. And I think those discussions are probably happening right now. Uh, we, we're, we're pushing for those doses. So. Um, we'll work to increase the speed of boosters. Of boosters. The, the team has accomplished a lot this this month already. I don't want to give the impression that there's not a lot of boosters have gone in. You know, as children became eligible, they were getting their shots. The immunocompromised, those who live in long-term care homes, those that have been over 60, frontline healthcare professionals. These have all been the focus, and that was the right focus. Um, and now we'll expand that focus, and, and we'll continue to push for supply. So. Um, I don't think anyone would argue that getting these key um, vulnerable groups back with their boosters and vaccinations first was the right way. So, so we'll expand the focus. The boosters are coming. Um, I can tell you that uh, Dr. Strang and Public Health and myself, we met with, um, we met with Ian Rankin and Gary Burrell uh, this morning, and we have a few takeaways from that meeting. Uh, some, great, some great points were raised there. Uh, one of them was around paid sick time, and uh, we're, we've already, we're already working on looking at ways to stand up the old program again, and we've reached out to the federal government so we can all be on the same page as we were last time. So there's a lot that, that's moving. That's moving. Um, the ask of Nova Scotians um, is just be extra cautious while you wait for your booster. Um, be extra cautious in, in limiting your, your contacts. That's, that's something that's in your control. That's your decision. So please slow down. Um, please be cautious. Uh, I know you will, and, and we appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Strang. Uh, thank you, Premier, and good afternoon, everybody. If you'd asked me in November what I thought of the holidays would look like, I certainly would not have come close to imagining uh, where we are today. Uh, until Omicron, Nova Scotia has, uh, or we were set to have a relatively smooth holiday season. Uh, instead, we are battling a new variant and moving backwards, unfortunately, not forwards. What we know about the Omicron variant is impacting uh, our, our, our province uh, and, and how it is doing that is changing as fast as the virus is spreading. The restrictions that we announced last Tuesday just will not be enough to uh, protect our healthcare system and our most vulnerable. The cases continue to rise, hospitalizations are starting to increase, and we now have outbreaks in uh, two outbreaks in hospitals and, and several in long term care facilities. And we have staffing shortages throughout our healthcare system and other critical services, with many people uh, either being sick or isolating. So this is just not sustainable, and we we need to lock down even further to lessen the impact and make sure that we have the staff that we need to provide care to Nova Scotians when they need it. So new restrictions will be come into effect uh, at 6 a.m. On, on tomorrow, Wednesday, uh, December 22nd, and will be in place at least until January the 12th. 
We will continue to monitor things closely and regularly reassess uh, the need for any further changes. So I'll give you an overview of the new restrictions now, and you can find full details uh, in the press release that has been issued today as well. So first of all, the distancing and masking requirements announced last week remain into effect. We are lowering the informal gathering limit to 10 people from the same household or in a consistent social group. I know this is not welcome use to people with big families, but our goal is to slow things down and limit our contacts. Uh, larger, groups, larger groups do the opposite. They give the virus more room to spread. Festivals, special events, sports events, and in-person performances uh, are, will be paused. Groups of 10 indoors and 25 outdoors can participate in sport practices and training, uh, but spectators, games, and tournaments will not be allowed. And the same group sizes uh, will be allowed for arts and culture rehearses, rehearsals and for virtual performances. But again, no spectators, uh, no, no performances or competitions, and no in, I'm sorry, no competitions and no in person performances will be allowed. For events held by a recognized business or organization, the gathering limit uh, will now be 25% of legal, legal capacity to a maximum of 50 people indoors and outdoors. So this includes things like faith services, wedding ceremonies, funerals and associated visitations, movie theaters, meetings and training. Uh, for weddings and funerals, uh, receptions will not be allowed, but uh, we, we allow the, the actual ceremony and with funerals associated visitations. For uh, It's important at this time of year, but uh, in-person faith services will only be allowed to have one person singing. Uh, we'll, we'll not allow choirs or congregational singing, and that's simply a reflection of uh, singing significantly increases uh, the likelihood of spread of, of virus into a shared airspace. And food and liquor license establishments like bars and restaurants, if they have performance, will only be able to have uh, one singer. Places like retail businesses, malls, museums, libraries, and recreation and leisure businesses and organizations will be able to continue to operate, but at 50% capacity. And in, for, for them, they, they previously established plans to uh, with directional arrows and other things that help control the flow of people and keep distancing. Uh, we we're asking them to put those back into place as quickly as possible uh, to manage that 50% capacity. Fitness and recreational facilities can continue to operate at 50% capacity, and that's in recognition of the importance of, of people uh, to uh, have opportunities to maintain their physical and, and mental health. And we will allow one-on-one -on -one personal training to continue. Uh, food and liquor license establishments uh, can continue to operate, but at 50% capacity, uh, and there needs to be the phys required physical distancing between tables, and there will now be a limit of 10 people per table. And as well, they will have to stop dine-in service at 11 p.m. and close to uh, seated uh, any seated service uh, at midnight, but uh, takeout and pickup will still be allowed beyond midnight. Personal services like hair salons uh, will be able to continue to operate uh, uh, at their maximum capacity with physical distancing, but services that require the removal of masks uh, by, by the client will not be allowed to be offered. We also need to make some changes to the restrictions that protect vulnerable residents and long-term care homes. We will now have a limit of two consistent visitors per resident. So uh, we'll still the importance of still allowing social uh, interaction, but families and friends will have to choose two consistent people to be the visitors. And one or both of those could be also be the designated caregiver. Mm -hmm. Residents will only be able to leave the facility their, their, their residential care facility for medical appointments uh, or for a drive in a facility vehicle or a drive with one of their uh, one or both of their two consistent visitors, um, even if those people, the residents are fully vaccinated. 
uh, and res it will only be residents who have had a booster dose uh, that will be able to access service providers within the facility for recreational activities and personal services like hairstyling. Uh, it's, it's certainly much easier to read off this list of restrictions than it is to implement and follow them. Uh, but I'm asking for everybody's support and your help to uh, follow these, to understand them and follow them, to help us slow down uh, the spread of this uh, very infectious uh, variant of, of COVID-19, uh, to protect those who are more vulnerable uh, in our healthcare system and other critical services. Next, I want to talk about some of the important changes to our testing program. These changes do not come easily. We have built our pandemic response uh, with a key component of testing, and that has been uh, recognized nationally and internationally. And certainly the commitment of Nova Scotians to testing has been, uh, has been incredible. But Omicron and the challenges it's, it's, it's presenting is forcing us to change our approach. Before I share the details, I do want to address some concerning behavior that's been reported from staff and volunteers at our various testing and distribution sites. There have been numerous, numerous reports of people being physically uh, and verbally abusive, uh, making physical threats and even stealing test kits. This is just not acceptable. We've gotten this far caring about and supporting one another by making personal sacrifices for our collective well-being. So please, let's not stop that now. We do not have an unlimited supply of rapid test kits. We are working rapidly to get as much as we can, but it's not unlimited. Across the country, it's not unlimited. And we only have so many people who can staff assessment centers without borrowing from other parts of the healthcare system. And our lab has limits as well. These are facts we can't change. We have to deal with them. Therefore, we need to change our testing program to make sure that the people who need tests the most get them first. That means we will be limiting PCR testing to people who have symptoms or are close contacts and are at increased risk for severe disease or live in a congregate living setting or are integral to keeping our healthcare system running. For everyone else, even those with symptoms who aren't in one of the above groups, you will need to start using rapid tests. If your rapid test is positive, you will, no, you, you will no longer need to do a follow-up PCR test. You assume you have COVID and then follow with isolation and notifying your close contacts. People have become used to using rapid tests. I acknowledge that uh, and using those to make sure they don't have COVID. We encouraged you to do this, to stay safe uh, over the last number of weeks and months, but that was before we knew what Omicron would bring. With the volume of cases, we need to prioritize our supply and prioritize our whole testing capacity to ensure that those who need a test get one and get a timely return of their result. So this means we will no longer make rapid tests widely available. We won't be restocking public libraries or any other places where we've had uh, ready access to uh, rapid tests. We're also pa pausing our workplace testing programs in lower risk workplaces. So if you're going to hospitals or pharmacies looking for rapid tests, please stop. You won't find any there either. And please do not hoard or stockpile the existing rapid tests you have. Only use them when you need to. And please share them with others if you have a supply, if they need one uh, for the testing reasons that we've outlined above. I certainly appreciate all Nova Scotians' commitment to testing. We have done, uh, you've, you've done this because we've asked you to do this, but we now need to change uh, simply because of, as I said, the pressures and the requirements of Omicron. We will have more to say about this later this week. We're working out some of the final details, including how exactly we will distribute rapid test kits. So those who need, who need them because they're symptomatic or a contact, you know they, they can get a rapid test kit. Uh, our new approach, this new approach will take effect December 22nd. But I wanna reassure people moving forward that if you meet the criteria for a test, whether it's PCR or rapid test kit, you will have access to one. But we have to put limits on uh, how we're using uh, other types of testing that are lower priority. 
the situation with Omicron is also making a booster dose that much more important. The premier has asked, uh, asked us all in the health system to pull out all the stops to make this happen more quickly. And we're talking to all our partners and urgently working on solutions to get booster doses into arms uh, as quickly as possible and as soon as people are eligible at their six month mark. We've already opened up additional appointments for booster doses for those 60 plus in the last few weeks. And later this week, 75,000 appointments will open for early January. Also in January, any unfilled pediatric appointments at the IWK clinic will be con converted to appointments for adult booster doses. And then our mobile outreach team will start giving out more than 4,000, uh, sorry, we'll give out about 4,000 more vaccine doses every week. So starting this Thursday, uh, December 23rd, booking will open to those age 50 to 59 who have reached the 168 days after their second dose of COVID vaccine. We asked everybody else, uh, those under 50, to please be patient. We are working as hard as we can to get more vaccines from the federal government and to add more clinics and appointments. Our goal is to open booster dose appointments to those under 50 as soon as possible in the new, in the new year. But as the premier said, we have always followed the principle that we can't, we will not open appointments until we had certainty of vaccine supply uh, from the very beginning of our vaccine program that has served us well. We have not had the confusion and disappointment and frustration that many other jurisdictions have had about by getting their appointments ahead of their vaccine supply. But we are work doing working as diligently as we can to increase our vaccine supply as quickly as possible. I want to end today speaking to you from my heart. This is a worrisome, sad, and frustrating time. As your Chief Medical Officer of Health, I feel immense pressure to make the right decisions to protect Nova Scotians and to find the best balance to minimize harm from COVID and COVID control measures. I'm not going to get it right every time, and in ret retrospect, perhaps we did not get things quite right last week. Things are changing fast with this new variant and there is limited information. But please know that my recommendations and decisions always have the best interests of all Nova Scotians in mind. So again, I'm asking for your help and your continued support to our pandemic response. What we're asking you to do now is probably the most difficult request we have made yet. This is a long two years and there's a lot of disappointment about having to do this yet again. Uh, in the holiday season, but that we that that is our reality, and we have to deal with it. So I hope you take advantage of a quieter holiday season to slow down and reflect on what is most important: friends, family, and good health. Hope is fundamental to the true meaning of Christmas, and so I ask all Nova Scotians of all faiths and beliefs to keep your hope and your love for one another care for one another, be kind to one another, support one another, and we will get through this. I'd like to pass on to all Nova Scotians my sincere wishes for a happy, healthy, and slow holiday season. Back to you, Marla. Thank you, Dr. Strang, and thank you, Premier. Uh, we'll now take questions from reporters. We have a number of reporters on the line, so we'll do our best to get to as many as possible in the amount of time that we have. We'll start with Graham Benjamin with Global. Go ahead, Graham. Hi there, thank you. Question for the Premier. Um, how close are we to imposing border restrictions with the other Atlantic provinces? <laughs> We've seen Newfoundland and uh, Prince Edward Island take these measures. Um, are we close to doing that before Christmas? Um, I, I'll ask Dr. Strang to kind of elaborate, but but the answer is we're not we're not focused on border restrictions right now. Obviously, I respect uh, Newfoundland's decision and and PEI's decision. Um, they have a bit different situation. Their islands, you know, they're a bit different stage um, in this kind of outbreak, um, but. But where we are right now, I mean, we have 500 cases a day for for four four plus days now, record number of cases. We we have we have a lot of COVID around us, um, and that's not a great, certainly not a great feeling. It's a reality. So the border the border measures um, tend to be effective when you're trying to keep COVID out. 
Um, but we we have it here now, so we're focused on on the on the restrictions. And and just don't forget that we we the border there's border been border restrictions in place all along. Um, if you're if you're not vaccinated and and you're coming into Nova Scotia, you still have an obligation to to isolate. So um, it's um, I, I'll get Dr. Strang to elaborate, but it's not it's not been a topic of our recent discussions that that border uh, restrictions at this stage would help us get get further get get through this. Dr. Yeah, no, the, the premier's right. I mean, uh, <laughs> the border is and what PEI and Newfoundland are doing is to help um, uh, keep the virus out. And, uh, you know, I talked with Dr. Morrison and PEI earlier today, and they're still seeing most of their cases are coming from people traveling into the province. So they're they're in a very different place. Unfortunately, we were one of we are we are uh, have a much different and higher level of COVID, and in fact, we were exporting COVID to uh, New Brunswick and PEI a couple of weeks ago. So we always, you know, say is are any restrictions we put in are they necessary? Are they needed? Um, and certainly at, at this point in time, you know, border restrictions have a lot of negative impacts and are not going to have a, a any real substantive benefit to our COVID response. Graham, do you have a follow-up question? I do, yes. I just wanted to ask Dr. Strain just about um, the, the testing strategy and the changes there. Just uh, We're seeing, for example, this morning, just <clears throat> five, over 500 people in Bedford all waiting for rapid tests. You also said there's some stockpiling of testing happening as well. Do you feel that there's just been this over-emergence of um, like just uh, reliance on rapid testing um, over other health and safety measures like masking, sanitizing, physical distancing, things like that? So, I mean, we, I think Nova Scotians, we've asked them to add in regular testing to part of their, their COVID response. And we've done that for the last year. So, um, you know, I'm not, you know, we don't, we're not blaming people for that. We're do, they're doing what we've asked, uh, but circumstances are now different, but it is also important that, you know, people are, uh, I'm certainly hearing anecdotes or people are saying, uh, I got a, I got a, ne- a, a rapid test that's negative. Therefore I'm okay. Uh, Omicron, uh, is even more because it's so infectious. You could have a, a rapid test today and be uh, be negative, and tomorrow you'll be positive. In fact, we we're dealing with a, a, a cluster of cases that all bunch of people who believing they were doing the right thing did rapid tests a few days ago. All went to a party together. Well, now we have a bunch of them are tested po- or, or positive cases because many of them just tested positive the next day. So r- rapid testing has its place, but it's critically important that uh, people stop their social activities as much as possible. Do not use rapid testing as a reason to say, well, I can then, I'm okay, I'm negative, I can go continue my social activities. Uh, and, and, and therefore we're asking people to change their behavior around uh, how they, around getting tests uh, and then how they use those tests. We need to prioritize people who need to have a test because they're symptomatic or other reasons need to have access to either PCR or rapid test kit and people who don't need those tests tests uh, should not be looking to get rapid tests uh, moving forward. Just if I could on that, uh, Marla, I think this is a really important question because um, the Nova Scotians have taken great pride in, in their, their testing and, and it's, a, it's, 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 it's a community service really. But with this, with this variant, um, if a person is exposed to COVID this morning, and they test tonight, they're going to test negative. Uh, if they test tomorrow, they're going to test negative. And the day after, they're going to test negative uh, because the virus has to be uh, in a person's body, kind of growing, I guess, to use a technical term, for at least 72 hours. So so we're seeing people test every day, thinking they're fine, when really they need to be watching the calendar, thinking about their contacts, thinking about their own exposure and testing at the appropriate time. So uh, Nova Scotians have done what we asked, uh, but now, 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 now the ask is that we do focused testing uh, because um, the testing is a peace of mind. But if, you, if you're not testing at the appropriate time, it's, it's a false sense of security. And um, there's no room for a false sense of securities in, in this environment right here. So, so we have to be smart with our testing. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll lead in testing, but it'll be in, in focused testing. And we just need uh, to kind of share that educational piece with Nova Scotians because we do hear a lot. I tested negative two times in a row, and then I've tested positive. Well, that's because you tested at the appropriate time in that last test. So um, so thank you for asking that important question about testing. Thank you. We'll go to Keith Doucette next with the Canadian Press. Go ahead, Keith. Keith, 
Keith, are you there? Okay, we'll come back to Keith. We'll go to Jean Laroche with CBC. Uh, I think we might be having trouble with our mute button here. My apologies. There we go. All right. Uh, Dr. Strang, I'm going to start where you ended uh, this uh, with a bit of a mea culpa about last week. What should or could you have done last week that would have made things any better this week? No, I'm, I'm just wa I just wanted to point out to people that, uh, you know, that it, people who are looking at things in hindsight, that maybe we should have acted differently a, a bit, uh, a bit harder. We're hearing that, that criticism, but uh, uh, there's, I just want to let people know that we're aware of that. Uh, we're always trying to make decisions on the best information and try to find the right balance. And just and and ret in retrospect, in hindsight, that maybe we didn't get the balance quite right last week. But again, a, a lot has changed between last Tuesday and today as well. So um, I just want people to hear that uh, that uh, you know we're always. Think you know we're always. I always continue to question. I ask my team to question: Do we have things right, and did we get that decision right? So, uh, and and just looking backwards, sometimes you go, oh, maybe we could have, maybe we maybe we would have done exactly the same thing. But just people to know that we're uh, that we're not just making decisions and and just believing we're absolutely got it com completely right. And 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 um, but these are very difficult uh, times with rapidly changing information. John, do you have a follow up question? I do, and, and I apologize if it's going to sound like I'm picking on you, Dr. Strang, but uh, last week, uh, it seems to me you said that uh, supply wasn't an issue in terms of vaccines, uh, nor was staffing. How did that change uh, in just a week? No, that was we were talking about where we were uh, at, at the current time. We were we were had always been working on trying to increase our supply and in, in, into January uh, and increase our vaccination uh, capacity. Um, but uh, you know we, we've been focusing our vaccine efforts through to, uh, November and December in some major uh, other areas. Yeah, uh, kids, uh, uh, um, you know, immunocompromised and the long-term care facilities uh, with with additional doses of vaccine and doing as much as we could 16 above with uh, with booster doses and we are going to be uh, shifting some of the from those other areas into more emphasis on booster doses but uh, moving forward we we clearly know that we need to uh, uh, get it more vaccine and as we, uh, we we will build capacity to deliver uh, as much vaccine as we can get okay we'll go back to Keith Doucette with the Canadian press Keith are you there uh, yeah, Dr. Strang, I was wondering, in terms of numbers per 100,000, can we put this in context for Nova Scotians in terms of the severity of the outbreak here? Are we, in fact, the highest in Canada at this point in terms of our outbreak? Um, uh, I haven't looked at that directly. I'm, I've, I've seen some stuff, and, it, you know, the people have told me, I haven't seen the data directly, that we are among the, some of the highest rates in uh, uh, in Nova Scotia and certainly in the Halifax area for 100,000. Um, so, but you know, it, it is what it is. So that 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 just highlights the seriousness of the situation we have and why we have to uh, focus on uh, on controlling this as quickly as we can and, and keeping the level of spread within, quite frankly, the capacity of our healthcare system to deal with uh, even a very small percentage of people getting more severely ill. Uh, that we have to keep that within the capacity of our healthcare system, uh, both for COVID, but also if our healthcare system gets overwhelmed, then there's all sorts of other non-COVID healthcare needs that can't be met effectively as well. Keith, do you have a follow-up question? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, and on, in terms of uh, holiday season travel within the province, uh, I don't think I heard you say anything about that. If you did, I must have missed it. But I'm just wondering what your advice is to people who may uh, want to uh, uh, drive from one community to another at this point. Uh, what can well, you tell us about that? I'm hoping Nova Scotians can understand that we're saying slow down, uh, limit your social contacts, that that clearly means be, be careful and be thoughtful about what kind of travel you're doing. Um, you know, that, that's, that to me would be inherent and part of this. Just slow down, stay close to home, stay in small groups. Uh, we will get to see your board of family and your friends and, you know, across the province, uh, you know, uh, at some point in 2022, but not right now. Next, we'll go to Sarah Plowman with CTV. Go ahead, Sarah. 
Uh, Dr. Strang, given where we are now, I was wondering if you could help Nova Scotians brace themselves for maybe what's to come. Like, what would be the best case scenario here? And perhaps what you guys are looking at, potentially one of the worser case scenarios in terms of numbers and hospitalizations. Well, we're realistic. Even if we stayed at around, and we're likely to see our, you know, our, our 400, maybe 450, 500 cases a day will be around for at least uh, in the next week. Um, and we, you know, we're seeing, you know, one to two new hospitalizations a day over the last few days. Uh, that is uh, kind of the best case scenario because we are, I think one of the reasons we are not seeing exponential growth in cases is, you know, uh, last week people started to slow down. Uh, we put restrictions on last Tuesday that came into effect Friday. So we're, we, it usually takes about, you know, by the time somebody's exposed, then it's about four to five days before they get positive. And so we're always four to five days behind at least to see the impact of our measures. So I think we are starting to see the benefit in, you know, plateauing where more of a plateauing effect, but still that's at a very high, you know, five, 450, 500 cases a day will put pressure on our healthcare system. So we have to go further and, and, uh, the, and, and the, 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 what we expecting to see, and this is all dependent on Nova Scotians really taking to heart what we said last week and what we're emphasizing strengthening today, slow down, stay close to home, small groups, uh, only, only, you know, it's, you know, really, really necessary activities. And if we all do that, we will start to see a slowing down of the transmission of even, of even Omicron, because even though it's highly infectious, uh, it can't spread if, if uh, you have, if, uh, if you're, if we're following, the public health uh, measures. It'll it, it there'll be some spread, but it'll be much lower spread, and our case numbers should start to come down, and therefore our our our, our impact and severe illness should start to come down. Uh, but we're needing we're going to need to stick with this for a few weeks to really bring things back down into a much safer level. Sarah, do you have a follow up question? Yeah, if people don't do that, what's the worst case here? Or not worse, but what what could we see? I just want people to understand what we could see here. Well, if we continue to have ongoing high case numbers and and building hospitalization rates, we reach a point where our health where our healthcare system uh, it becomes very very challenged from two perspectives: higher numbers of people requiring medical care in hospitals, and worsening of an already existing uh, uh, challenges around getting the number of healthcare workers we need uh, simply because uh, of, of we have many, many healthcare workers who are isolating can't come to work because they are either a case or a contact. So both of those together are not a pretty scenario in terms of the ability of us to continue to deliver uh, fundamentally important healthcare. So it's in all of our best interest to do what we're, we're asking you to do to follow the rules and your own personal measures. Because all of us, none of us know when we, we will need the healthcare system to be there for us or for our families.